What is AFib? Let's see if this plays. AFib is this organized electrical activity in the atria. And uh, most commonly, we simplify it as, as a rhythm that is initiated by some ectopy in the pulmonary veins. That's a gross simplification. Um, the rapid electrical activity and disorganized electrical activity in the atria lead to uh, irregularly irregular uh, ventricular activity, which is what you see in the electrogram. And it's not just uh, a, a curiosity on the EKG. Uh, it's a very relevant uh, phenomenon because it leads to increased stroke and mortality. It's not a benign condition. And um, it's been recently associated with other problems such as dementia, not just uh, uh, vascular dementia from a system from a cerebral embol embolism, but also any type of dementia. So it is it is a problem that is increasingly recognized as something that we just have to address, and it's increasing in its prevalence. This shows the estimated um, prevalence of non uh, non paroxysmal AFib as projected by current trends of the aging population, and we're looking at having a prevalence of about 5 to 6 percent of the entire population of the U.S. in a few decades. A few definitions that you need to be aware of. Paroxysmal AFib is one that terminates within seven days of onset, and, and that includes episodes that happen for two minutes every two years or episodes that last uh, six days every other day. So it's a, a huge range of AFib burden for a given patient with, a, with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Persistent AFib is that one that re, uh, lasts for more than seven days. Long-standing uh, persistent AFib is that AFib that has been continuous, uninterrupted for uh, more than one year. And permanent AFib is that AFib that the patient and the doctor give up on treating, meaning we're not going to we make a decision that we're not going to get rid of AFib. We're not going to cardio bed, we're not going to give antiarrhythmics. There's nothing specific about AFib. It's about the patient and, and his or her choice that they and the physician that they decide not to treat that AFib. That is permanent. You may go from permanent to persistent if you decide, okay, we're going to treat it. We're going to treat it. There's nothing specific about AFib. And you, in the literature, you will see that we specify that all the studies apply to non-valvular AFib. That is AFib that doesn't occur in, in the, due to rheumatic mitral stenosis, mechanical or bioprosthetic heart valves or mitral valve repair. What are the treatment goals with AFib? Number one, suppress the symptoms, if there are any. Number two, obviously improve the outcomes, and that includes preventing strokes, preventing tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy, maybe preventing dementia, maybe reducing mortality. Uh, how do we approach the treatment? Rhythm control or rate control plus anticoagulation. Very simple. Rate control. This is a long slide, but I think you need to be familiarized. This is coming from the, the latest uh, guidelines. Rate control, the mainstay, beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. Uh, we use them um, IV in the setting of, uh, of um, acute, uh, acute uh, rapid ventricular response. Um, in the absence of pre-excitation, if, if there is an accessory pathway, if you have this irregularly irregular white complex rhythm that you've seen a few slides today, you cannot use uh, AV nodal conduction agents because you will force more activations going through the accessory pathway. You will increase the heart rate. You may get into ventricular fibrillation. Uh, if the patient is un unstable hemodynamically, you cardiovert. Um, it's important to assess the rate uh, of the patient um, not only when they show up in the office, but also during a physical activity, whether you use a halter to monitor when they're ambulatory or you put them in a, in a treadmill to see how fast the heart rate goes. You may need to add uh, the joxin to get better rate control during exercise. Uh, IV amiodarone is, uh, is used uh, acutely, it's very useful acutely to control the rate, even if you're not going to achieve sinus rhythm. Uh, we think of amiodarone as an antiarrhythmic, but it's also a good rate controlling rate. Some uh, controversies have been around regarding how aggressive we need to uh, control the heart rate. Do we need to aim for a heart rate less than uh, 90 beats per minute at rest? And there are studies showing that up to 110 is fine, provided that there's no tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. So if you have a patient that you decide rate control, you have to periodically assess the LV function to make sure there's no, there's no um, uh, tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. Uh, we don't pace, we don't ablate and pace until we have tried medications. There's a few things that you need to be aware of. When do we cardiovert? Well, we need to cardiovert. When we, when we decide to cardiovert as a form of rhythm control, you have to 
understand that this is like rebooting a computer when it freezes. You cardiovert, you get back in sinus, but that does not prevent future episodes of AFib. Uh, and when you're cardioverting, you are taking responsibility for the sinus rhythm that, that occurs afterwards. What that means is if there's, a, if there's a thrombus in the appendage and you cardiovert, you are putting the patient at risk for strokes. So you need to uh, prevent, if you decide to cardiovert, whether it's electrical or chemical, if you decide to cardiovert, you need to make an assessment as to what the, rhythm, the risk of stroke is. If the AFib or flutter has been uh, more than 48 hours or a known duration, you need to at least give anticoagulation for three weeks and after cardioversion for another four weeks, okay? Uh, if the, if the uh, AFib or flutter have been for less than 48 hours, you may shock, but you still need to uh, anticoagulate for four, uh, for four weeks at least. Uh, and from then on, then you have to make an assessment of the risk of stroke, and that's my, my next talk. Um, a few things. AFib uh, cardioverted by uh, drugs is no less uh, risky in terms of post-cardioversion stroke risk than, than, uh, than electrical cardioversion. All right. So um, let me see. Going backwards. So what drugs do we use? This has been discussed before. When you're uh, choosing a drug to um, achieve sinus rhythm in AFib, uh, you need to be very clear as to what kind of heart you're dealing with. If there's no structural disease, you, use, you can use almost every drug. If there is structural disease, you're putting the patient at risk by using certain drugs. So in the presence of um, um, heart failure, you can only use amiodarone and ofetolite because those two drugs have been shown to be safe. Um, uh, dronedarone increases mortality. Sorolo increases mortality. Um, of course, uh, flaconide and propafenone increase mortality. If you have coronary artery disease, um, you open uh, the door to dofetolide and sorolo and dronedarone if there is no LV dysfunction. When the heart is normal, you can use any drugs you like. Um, um, and I would point out that for any kind of uh, heart disease or absence of heart disease, you can always do ablation. So what do we do when, when we ablate AFib? Well, when you come up with a strategy to treat a disease, you need to understand it, right? And the problem with AFib is we don't understand much of it. We know there's electrical uh, disorganization in the atria. Some patients have shown, uh, some studies have shown that the very first beat of AFib starts from the pulmonary veins, and that's what led to the current procedure. Well, if the first bit comes from the pulmonary veins, let's just burn the pulmonary veins and we'll get rid of AFib. And it turns out that that works that work, that work better than, than drugs. So whether it's ectopic bits from the pulmonary veins or there's innervation of the left atrium that makes the uh, atrial physiology prone to atrial fibrillation or re-entry or micro re-entry or a combination of all, it seems clear that most of the uh, the money is in the left atrium, in the back of the left atrium. And what we do is we burn in different variants, we burn in the left atrium. If you think that the goal is to get rid of ectopy from the, the pulmonary veins, we create these circles aiming at pulmonary vein isolation so that electrical impulses from the veins cannot spread into the rest of the atrium. And therefore, you will prevent those triggers of AFib. And that happens sometimes. There are patients that we bring to the lab for AFib ablation, and the patient goes into AFib. You isolate the veins. You can see the AFib still in the veins, and then the rest of the atrium remains, goes back to sinus. And those are the ones that, hey, we, we know what we're doing. Unfortunately, they're a minority. A lot of patients, especially patients with persistent AFib, who cares about the triggers from the pulmonary vein when the patient has been in AFib for a year? Uh, there's no trigger anymore. <clears throat> and in those cases, you need to be, to be more aggressive and do more extensive ablation. Uh, there's different variants of the lesion sets we do. What they have in common is we ablate in the, in the, in the left atrium close to the pulmonary veins. So these are the um, strategies and targets that have been proposed to ablate. Pulmonary vein isolation is, this, is the standard of care. Uh, whether you do it at the very mouth of the veins or with a wide area circumferential ablation, has to do with what so much with how much tissue you want to ablate. Antral isolation entails getting rid of electricity from the entire back of the left atrium. So the tissue between the pulmonary veins, the entire posterior wall gets disconnected. Some operators look for uh, ablation of uh, innervation of the left atrium, which we can mask by doing rapid pacing, and the patient will have bradycardic responses. Um, 
bottom line is we still don't know exactly what we're doing, but it seems to be working. And how do we know that? Well, because we achieve symptom control. And this is one of the many studies that have been done, randomized control studies looking at uh, freedom from symptomatic arrhythmia in patients that had failed antiarrhythmics. If you compare ablation um, versus uh, drug therapy, uh, most commonly flecainide in this study, it's more than twice. We're not perfect. It's in the 80% or so uh, range, our success at eliminating symptomatic AFib, but it's much better than drugs. Now, that's symptoms. Symptoms are very subject, uh, subjective. It is quite possible there are patients that have the same amount of AFib before and after ablation, but just don't feel it as much after the ablation. Quite possible. Uh, when studies have been done looking at uh, actual rigorous recordings, uh, Holter monitors or extended monitoring, uh, of AFib, we see that still we make a difference. Is it ablation, is it a, is appropriate um, to consider ablation as a first line of treatment? There's been three studies looking at this, looking at different endpoints, whether symptomatic AFib or AFib burden on t or time to documented recurrence of atrial tachyarrhythmia. The consensus here is that ablation can be used as a first line, but as I'll show you, Drugs do a decent job as a first attempt. So if you look at symptomatic AFib, Wozni and others from the Cleveland Clinic did a small study that showed that you had much better um, control of symptoms with uh, ablation as the first line of treatment compared to antiarrhythmic drugs. In this case, was flecainate and sorolol. Uh, the New England Journal paper three, four years ago looked at ablation versus drug therapies, and they, they looked at their endpoint was burden of AFib as documented in a, in a 48 hour halter. So they did halters every three months on these patients and they looked at the AFib burden. This is a bit more realistic. They're not looking at cure, they're not, they're not quantifying in how many patients they achieved cure of AFib. They look, assuming that everybody had some degree of AFib after ablation or after drug treatment, let's compare how much AFib are they having in both groups. And this is a kind of complex slide, but the, the bottom line here is that um, they achieved overall uh, less burden of AFib in the ablation group compared to the drug therapy group, but still, this is by no means cure. It just illustrates the reality of our endpoints here with uh, our success with ablation. Um, when you look at actual elimination of AFib on a seven-day halter, that was achieved in 77% of the patients uh, treated with ablation versus 65. So ablation, uh, drug therapy was not that bad. Um, and then they did a lot of other, qu other quantifications that I'm, I'm not going to get into. Uh, the bottom line is that it seems to do a better job than drugs, ablation, but drugs weren't that bad as a first line of treatment. Uh, another final, the last trial looking at AFib ablation as a first line of therapy by Morillo and others from Canada. Basically, antiremic drugs had uh, more recurrences than radiofrequency ablation. Uh, recurrences occurred in 72% of the drug group versus 54%. So we still had less than half of uh, less than half of the patients had a complete elimination of uh, AFib after two years of follow-up, um, and uh, the time to recurrence was obviously shorter with the drugs compared to ablation. The bottom line here is that um, the freedom from symptomatic AFib. Uh, as a first line with no prior antiremic drug, it's very similar in ablation versus, uh, versus uh, abla uh, drugs in the, in the New England Journal trial. In others, <coughs> you know, it's, it's, it's hard to believe whether this is going to be consistently found everywhere, that twice, twice the number of patients get better control with uh, ablation. The bottom line here is that it makes sense to try a drug as a first line of treatment, and especially when you have failed a drug, Ablation does a much better job. If you have failed a drug with prior antiremic uh, drug failure, whether you look at cryo versus thermocool or different, uh, different technologies, ablation does much better. So the, the, the bottom line here is we like to try a drug first and then ablation. All right, uh, what is the price we pay when we do an ablation? Well, there's a, procedure, a procedural risk. This is an invasive procedure that entails getting in the left atrium through a transeptal puncture and burning tissue. So we can tear the heart and create a fusion and tamponade. Uh, we can create the risk of stroke if, if clots form around the catheters that we insert in the left atrium. Very, very rarely, but very, very um, scaringly, uh, atriosophageal fistula can happen. And this is because as we ablate, as we burn tissue in the back of the left atrium, the 
corn, the esophagus is quite close and there's risk of damage to the esophageal vasculature, which leads to necrosis. And a few weeks later, after the ablation, the patient may have a super infection from the oral flora that leads to widespread infection similar to endocard classic endocarditis and uh, multiple strokes from air emboli. Other bad things can happen. In general, this is done routinely and safely, but you need to be aware of all these things in order to prevent them. Now, <clears throat> what is our second goal for AFib management? Stroke prevention. Do we know anything about ablation uh, achieving stroke prevention? We do not, okay? There's one study, the Cabana trial, that has been going on for the past five years, looking at the endpoint of stroke after ablation versus drugs, and we still don't have the data. There are a fair amount of observational studies, the first one by Moraes group with uh, 400 patients, ablation, ablated versus no, no ablation, and they showed that the, the risk of stroke was actually acceptable for patients that had undergone an ablation compared to non-ablated patients. Uh, sorry, compared to no AFib patients. There's a large, very, very large registry from Utah uh, published a few years ago, uh, more than 20,000 patients, uh, more than that actually, uh, 40,000 patients that uh, had either no AFib versus AFib that were not ablated versus AFib that were ablated. And here is, this is a complex slide that has many colors. Uh, the colors have to do with the CHAT score. So the higher the risk, the, the patients were grouped in, in risk of stroke uh, with AFib ablated versus no AFib. And what, what you can't see very much here, but in the, in the monitor here you see, for example, let's look at the, high, the very high risk. This is a patient, uh, freedom from stroke, patient with a high risk of stroke uh, with AFib not ablated versus with AFib ablated. Same kind of risk of stroke to start with, half the, half the stroke incidence if you got ablated. The differences are there for lesser risk uh, pay groups, but the bottom line is that this registry suggests that ablation may reduce the risk of stroke. Uh, other data from Taiwan seem to go in the same direction. Patients that are ablated without recurrence have less incidence of stroke compared to AFib patients that undergo medical control. The jury is still out. We will hear uh, from uh, Cabana trial. Mortality also seems to be in the same direction, but Cabana is going to tell us whether these hard endpoints are, are affected by ablation or not. So when is AFib ablation appropriate? We have to individualize. AFib is very heterogeneous in terms of symptoms, the AFib burden, the presence or absence of structural heart disease, the presence or absence of other risk factors for stroke and dementia. So we need to balance, balance all these issues um, in order to choose uh, when to ablate. And the truth is that we're getting more and more aggressive with ablation. We know our results are much better with paroxysmal compared to persistent. We know that the natural history of AFib is one of progression, that you start with paroxysmal and eventually go into persistent. So the, the goal is to ablate as many patients in paroxysmals, in the paroxysmal stage before they go into uh, persistent. But uh, it's, a, it's, a gain, it's a difficult um, decision making that you have to do, balancing the patient, your own, uh, your own experience, your own comfort doing the ablation in, in more complex patients and the prospects of success. So I'm gonna keep going and discuss uh, the right strategies for stroke prevention in AFib, which is the second talk. So what can we do to prevent strokes in AFib? Either anticoagulate or close the appendage. Okay, and how do we can anticoagulate? We have warfarin that we've had for decades and the new anticoagulants that we've had for almost one decade now. The appendage closure is the newest approach. We have only the Watchman device approved in the United States as a, as a strategy for stroke prevention in AFib. We have other things that can be done, but they're not approved with that indication. And selecting the right strategy requires individualization of the risks and benefits. So let's see. So how do we assess the risk of stroke in AFib? Not everybody with AFib has the same risk of stroke, okay? A priori, the higher the risk of AFib-related stroke, the greater the benefit of appendix exclusion. Well, that's, that seems to be obvious, but most patients will have other competing uh, risks for stroke in AFib. We assess the risk of stroke using the chats vas scoring system. This is an acronym that stands for C is congestive heart failure, H for hypertension, A is, um, if your age is 75, you get two points. If your age is, uh, sorry, more than 65, you get one point. Prior stroke or TIA, you get two points. Vascular disease, whichever uh, organ 
counts as one point, and if your uh, gender is female, you get one point because females have a higher risk of stroke in AFib. So, um, where is the left atrial appendage in determining the risk? We don't know. This whole scoring system was developed specifically for AFib, but the appendage plays no role. The bottom line is that it, this, this scoring system works. Uh, it's an evolution. The chats vas scoring system is an evolution of an older scoring system called the CHATS-2. CHATS-2 only included uh, heart failure, hypertension, age more than 75, diabetes, stroke, and the maximum was six. And there, was, there seemed to be a near linear relationship between the score and the uh, adjusted uh, stroke rate per year. The chats vas is a bit more complex. Um, the maximum score is nine. The main value of the chats vas score is that if you have a zero score, your stroke risk is zero. So it is very good at allowing you to identify those patients for whom you say, you know what, I don't care about your AFib. You may be having AFib all the time. Paroxysmal versus persistent doesn't play any role here. It's the same risk. You may be having AFib 100% of the time, but if you have zero of those risk factors, your adjusted stroke risk is zero. Now, sounds very optimistic, but the truth is the most powerful predictor of stroke in AFib is a history of stroke or TIA. So we're very good at predicting the second stroke, not so much the first one. Um, okay, so, and the interesting thing is the chats vasc uh, scoring system is actually a very non-specific uh, indicator of disease. Uh, a Japanese group took patients after an acute coronary syndrome, all of them in sinus, and they looked at their outcomes in terms of infarction, stroke, and mortality relative to their chats vas score, and it was just as good a predictor as it is for stroke in AFib. It's a very crude indicator of um, risk, of risk of stroke or other just bad outcomes in general. And it, like I said, it lacks an assessment of the left atrial appendage induced risk. So we're gonna see more literature in the future about this. So well, how do I choose what to do with these patients? Um, you have to delineate individually uh, the risk, and I use four questions. Uh, and the first one is, what are the causes of stroke risk in this individual patient? Are there uh, only AFib-related uh, risk of stroke, or is the patient, does the patient have other diseases, other conditions that could lead to AFib-unrelated risk of stroke? Obviously, if the carotid is full of junk, who cares about the AFib? They may have AFib, but the risk of stroke has nothing to do with the appendage. Uh, then I need to individualize the risk of stroke prevention strategies. Anytime you give anticoagulation, you're buying yourself a risk of bleeding. And sure, some, some drugs have more risk of bleeding than others, and manufacturers uh, emphasize that one is better than another. It's intrinsic to the mechanism of action. You're thinning the blood, you're, you increase the risk of bleeding. That's unavoidable. And appendix occlusion strategies have procedural risks. You need to, you need to accept those. Now, you also have to ask yourself if there are any benefits of anticoagulation besides preventing left atrial thrombus in AFib. Obviously, if the patient has a mitral valve prosthesis that requires anticoagulation, who cares about the appendix as well, right? And then, of course, what is the prior patient's experience on anticoagulation? Have they bled? If you have a patient that bleeds from an unknown source, but every few weeks requires a transfusion, you cannot give anticoagulation. All right, so... A few more words about the chats vas score and how the same score could be, um, could be achieved by different conditions. So let's just show you two examples. Uh, on the left here, you have a patient that's 66 years old, so they get one point. Female, they get another point. Diabetic, you get another point. Hypertensive, another point. They have a calcium score in the CT of 450. That indicates vascular disease, so you get another point. Now, this patient comes to me, and I'm about to cardiovert. I do a TE, and she has an appendix thrombus. This patient has a very high risk of appendix-derived stroke, right? She already had a stroke in the making there. Now, let's look at this patient. 66-year-old, also one point. Patient has two uh, previous strokes in the past, so you get two points for that and has ischemic cardiomyopathy with congestive heart failure and a lot of uh, atheromatous plaque in the aortic arch. This patient was in sinus, but then they did a bypass surgery and developed post-operative AFib. It's AFib. So as far as the CHAT score, all I care is the diagnosis of AFib being there. This patient has a CHAT score of five. His strokes are coming from the plaque in the aorta. So, and, and it's AFib. You know, probably you get rid of the post-inflammatory state after, after the sternotomy and they may not have AFib anymore. Yet, 
by Chatra score, they are the same. You would treat this, very, this patient very differently compared to that one. And you know, this has been illustrated in, the, in the many other studies looking at the coincidence in patients with AFib of appendix thrombus and, and complex plaque. Both of them respond to anticoagulation. I'm not going to dwell on this. So there's some literature uh, suggesting that <coughs> appendage morphology may have an impact in the risk of stroke. Um, now, whether there's some, some, some groups of uh, appendage morphology that have been reported. The chicken wing uh, is, I think, is this one. Uh, it looks like a, the, the wing of a chicken. This, they call it a cactus. This is the wing sock. The truth is that nobody agrees on, on, on the grouping. I, we sent a paper once to a, a, a journal uh, on a very unusual case, and one reviewer thought this is a classic windsock appendage, and the other thought it was chicken wings. So it really depends on how hungry you are. Uh, <laughs> the bottom line is that it seems like the chicken wing morphology has been, has been associated with a lesser risk of stroke. All right, um, but we'll hear more about this in the, in the next few years for sure. What are the risk of stroke prevention strategies? Okay, let me show you here what happens when you give um, blood thinners to the patient. And this is only data, the newest data, comparing uh, warfarin against abigatran, against apixaban, against rivaroxaban, or edoxaban. Uh, with warfarin, no matter which study you look at, you have a risk of bleeding, annual risk of bleeding between 3 and 3.5% um, per year. With any of the NOACs, uh, you get a little bit less, specifically less with, uh, with a Pixaban, 2.1%, which the company likes to claim is just as good as aspirin. Um, but still, in that range, 2 to 3% risk of bleeding, no matter how you look at it. Um, mortality. Uh, mortality in these patients, and the, risk, the underlying risk of this population was a bit different, Rivaroxaban. Uh, the Rivaroxaban study looked at higher risk patients. But the risk of uh, mortality um, with AFib is about 4% per year. Uh, the, the, um, the NOACs don't seem to decrease it by much. The only study that reached statistical significance as, as far as reduction of mortality was uh, Apixaban, was size total. But again, 3.5 versus 3.9, who cares about the P wave, right? Um, so you buy yourself a risk of bleeding. And how well do you do reducing uh, stroke? Well, if you divide ischemic stroke versus hemorrhagic stroke, this is the data. On warfarin, you get an annual risk of stroke that is anywhere between 1 to 1.4%. So that's, pretty, that's a pretty good reduction. Uh, and the NOACs give you a very similar risk of ischemic stroke. Only, um, only the bigger trend rich significance, 0.9% uh, per year versus 1.2. They do a much better job at, job at reducing the hemorrhagic stroke. So hemorrhagic stroke is rare, about 0.5% per year, and most of the NOACs divide that by, I mean, drop that by half. So they are very good at reducing hemorrhagic strokes. They are just as good as warfarin at preventing ischemic strokes. And that, because hemorrhagic strokes are the ones that are more lethal, uh, if they achieve any benefit in mortality, it's probably due to reduction of hemorrhagic stroke. So, what are the, the what are, how about the appendage uh, ligations or exclusion? Watchman is the only one that's approved. So this is the Watchman. This is in clinical trial. We're about to start a trial on this one. And we're about to start a trial on this one. This is the wave crest. There's a lot of money here. That's why there's so many devices. There's a lot of money for companies to be made here. Let me review briefly what, what data is available about stroke occlusion, and it's only available with Watchman. Watchman is the only one that has paid the price and done several randomized clinical trials looking at strokes as the endpoint. The others have, looking at, have been looking at the anatomical endpoint of appendage closure, which is irrelevant. You care about pre uh, preventing strokes. You don't care about the anatomy. So if you look at all stroke or systemic embolism, uh, comparing Watchman versus Warfarin, very similar, all right? It's no better. It's no better than, than um, Watchman is no better than Warfarin. In fact, ischemic stroke may be even worse with the Watchman. The beautiful thing here is that you reduce about 80% the risk of hemorrhagic stroke. And these are the strokes that kill people. <laughs> 
And of course, um, most of the strokes, the strokes were related to um, within seven days of the implant. Cardiovascular death, half. So cardiovascular death uh, is half with the watchman compared to warfarin. How so? Perhaps because of this dramatic reduction of hemorrhagic strokes. So we're not as good as warfarin with watchman at preventing ischemic strokes, but because the patient is saved years of anticoagulation, you look better. And of course, you bleed less with the watchman, um, especially when you, you discount the procedure-related bleeds. So all in all, this is probably going to be, is here to stay. It's approved by the FDA, we're using it. The CMS uh, gave us a very restrictive uh, set of conditions to, for, for Medicare to pay for this device. You need to show that the patient is a candidate for warfarin, but has appropriate reasons to look for alternatives to warfarin, and several physicians have to agree that this is an appropriate implant. It's a, and the paperwork that we need to do to get uh, payment for this is insane, but it's here to stay, it's here to stay. You bleed less, obviously, uh, when, you, when you are on Watchman compared to ongoing warfarin, and the longer you follow up the patients, if you follow the patient up for 60 months, there's 71% reduction of bleeding because you're not on any blood thinners. That's the main advantage of, of the Watchman. And there are some procedural risks um, that uh, have to do with the learning curve. Uh, in the first uh, experience in the PROTECT AF study that was published in 2009, there were, in the first half, 9.9% of uh, safety events, most of these were um, pericardial effusions during implant. That has been dropped to about 3 to 4% with more experience. Um, and like I said, this is now approved and ongoing. So how do we continue making this decision? Again, we need to ask the third question. Are there any benefits of anticoagulation beyond the left atrial appendage? Like I said, if the patient has uh, other needs, other indications for, for anticoagulation, who cares about the appendage? You don't need to close it. And it's very interesting because there are studies that show that even in, in patients that have AFib, uh, only 65% of the strokes can be qualified as cardioembolic. Up to 25% of the strokes in patients with AFib may have, may have come from intrinsic cerebrovascular disease. And there's associations between AFib and a syndrome of a procoagulant systemic state that may have nothing to do with the appendage. Associations between AFib and myocardial infarction with complex plaque, as I mentioned, with abnormal carotid IMT. So there is other things that you need to consider when deciding anticoagulation versus appendix ligation. So a few things um, to keep in mind. If the patient, how to help making these decisions. If the patient has an extreme risk, if you have seen on a TE that the patient has a thrombus, you really need to <coughs> anticoagulate um, and perhaps consider, um, consider closing the appendage. NOAX, as I have here uh, below, is the first choice because of the superiority in, in all the clinical trials uh, compared to warfarin. But the warfarin is here to stay, it's not gonna go away. Uh, patients with financial constraints will prefer to be on warfarin. Some insurances want, don't, want, don't want to pay for NOAX unless you have tried uh, warfarin. If the patient has stable INRs and have no bleeding and good tolerance, warfarin is a, is a great drug. We have a lot of experience reversing it. We have a lot of experience handling it, so it's not a bad drug. Watchman, when do we consider it? When the patient has a bleeding on anticoagulation, when the patient has failed anticoagulation. That means if they've had a stroke, poor tolerance, history of hemorrhagic stroke, and they have good procedural can candidacy, and especially when they have a high appendage risk, if you have seen uh, smoke or thrombus in the appendix, this is a straightforward patient for, for closure. A few things that you need to know that are in the guidelines. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. If you have AFib and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you need to be an anticoagulation, regardless of the CHATS fast score, okay? Patient, 28-year-old with AFib and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy needs to be an anticoagulation. The pathogenesis is different. The risk of stroke is higher. You don't care about the chat vas score. Um, let's see. Uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has other issues that apply to rhythm control because you may want to choose um, uh, ami or disopiramide because it's a negative anotropic effect. And AFib ablation can work, uh, can work really well, but it may <clears throat> require more than one procedure. AFib in the setting of acute coronary syndromes, you want a cardiovert, 
because you don't want to you want to avoid uh, rapid ventricular responses, and you want to use beta blockers if you, if you if you need to uh, for slowing um, the ventricular response. Uh, these are the usual other things that we have kind of discussed, hyperthyroidism. These are issues that you need to be aware of. But the key thing that, that escaped many, many of us is the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that requires anticoagulation regardless of the, t of the risk of stroke.